Our next guest is quite distinguished. He's the former Prime Minister of Estonia, Tavi Roivas. Let's get his proper bio. Tavi was born on the 26th of September in Tallinn, Estonia. Was educated at the Secondary School of Science and the University of Tartu, School of Economics and Business Administration, where Tavi obtained a degree in foreign trade and marketing. He was the Prime Minister of the Republic of Estonia from 2014 to 2016, and I think we're all aware at, of how, how far ahead, how much progress that country has made. So without further ado, Tavi, thanks for joining us. Thank you very much for the very kind introduction. Obviously, at least half of you think that, oh my God, now you have a politician on stage, how bad can it go? Um, I tried to be not a typical politician uh, who doesn't understand much about tech. I tried to be, like I usually am, uh, thinking together with, um, with businesses, with um, innovative people, how governments could actually be on the same side, how governments can innovate uh, just like uh, businesses, just like private individuals and, and so forth. Now, I today invite you to imagine. Imagine what it would be like if governments would provide all the services in a similar level like all the private companies that do it at their best. Let me first introduce you to my best buddy. Can you see that? That's my iPhone. Now, this is, of course, I, I do have friends. I'm not that unpopular still. But um, this is something I, I probably interact with more than any of my friends on a daily basis. And probably most of you can relate to that. Now, I don't only use it for calling, obviously. I don't use it for texting only. I use it for... Um, all sorts of communication, but that's besides the point. I get most of my s private sector services with that phone without any uh, visiting of any offices. Just of today, I came here with a Latvian uh, flight company, boarding bus is right here. Not only the boarding bus, but also the customer card that gives me some sort of points that are in the kind of early version of, of utility tokens. Um, I have my uh, hotel booked with that device. I, I got my Taxify cab ordering with that device and so forth. All of you have probably hundreds of, of ways how to use your phone. Now think about public services. How many public services can you actually access with your phone. You are still, in most countries, expected to come and visit a civil servant. Well, when I was prime minister of my beautiful country, which is not far from here, I had an understanding that actually citizens might have something better to do than come and visit the public officials. Perhaps you agree, perhaps not, but you know that was my understanding of things. So instead of inviting them to come and meet us at registries and public offices for taxation purposes, for social subsidies. We have created throughout the last 16 to 17 years a society where a citizen should not come to any public office at all. They're welcome to visit, you know, if they want to, but they don't have to come. And, and uh, this is just you know, a small scale country, but imagine how much we would um, benefit if that would be a global thing. If you, you know, there are many nationalities here from many countries, if you could get your digital prescription in a pharmacy in Lithuania without actually meeting your doctor who might be in London, who might be in Tallinn, who might be anywhere for that matter. You just call the doctor, you get the prescription right here. Now, obviously, you might think that, you know, however could that be possible, because governments are difficult to change. 
let me give you one small secret. First of all, we need to look at the parallels, and, and the first parallel that actually enables me to do, and all of you to do, all the transactions with the body called uh, iPhone or any, any smartphone for that matter is, of course, my credit card. Now, I don't use the credit card itself, I only use the numbers on either side, I enter them to different apps, and this allows access to my wallet. Well, let me state that, you know, all of you who are even a bit to technology, you understand very well that this is not the best way actually to access your wallet, this is definitely not the safest way, but this is something we trust, so, you know, let's live with that. This invention, by the way, can anyone guess how old it is? 50 years, good guess? 60. 60, sold. Yeah, exactly 60 years ago, Diners Club came up with the first credit card, and the functionalities have changed a bit. Now there are like a bit more functions, but, but still, credit card, still today, is helping us to do e-commerce, to, to give access to our wallets. And in most cases, this is enough, because Anything Booking.com or, or, uh, or Airbnb or Uber or Taxify wants from you is your money. They don't want to know your name necessarily. They don't need to know for sure that this is you. They only need access to your wallet. That's fine. Now, to provide public services or to provide proper contracts between people, we need to do the same thing as credit card did with your wallet, giving access. We need to do the same thing with your ID. So as of today, most of the people in the world still, and that's kind of funny, rely on paper ID. Okay, it might act not exactly be only paper, there is some plastic involved, but in principle it's just something physical that you sh show to people, right? You're used to that. Now, if you have that, and, and there are many of those actually around the world that are already in place in digital space, that would, of course, obviously give you a lot of uh, more opportunities. Has any one of you seen that scribble before? None of you? Okay, so basically if you get a letter from me, and there is underneath the name Tavi Revas, which is exactly how my name is written, and there is some scribble, like that, for example then you assume that this was signed by me, right? And you are immediately willing to enter your own signature and you think, now we have a contract, right? So this is the year 2018. And this <laughs> invention is the best we can do in order to sign documents. Does that sound kind of best what that we can do? Well, not in my opinion. And of course, um, again, if we talk about uh, contracts on all sorts of uh, private level, like with banking and, and with all sorts of other things, there is a number of digital IDs available. But if you think whether they are properly used around the world, also for um, uh, public services, the answer sadly is no. And we still rely on signature, which is nothing more than a scribble that even my nine-year-old daughter would easily falsi uh, falsify or, or write to herself for that matter. Those of you who still remember your school days, um, I don't know how it was in your country, but in my country we had this um, diary that you had to bring home and at the end of every week uh, your mother had to sign that. Um, so, but if you didn't behave well in the, uh, in the lessons, then teachers wrote that, you know, your son wasn't behaving well or you got a bad grade or something like that. And I was told, you know, I never did it myself, of course, but I was told that some of us actually falsified their mother's, mother's signatures. So if they were able to do that when they were around 10, you know, what could go wrong when you do business, right? When you transfer millions of euros, for example. Now, um, in Estonia, we ha have introduced a quite simple way of, of digitally signing things. It's a two-way authentication. First, one side was 
on uh, card. Again, most of the countries in the world, actually, is definitely most of the countries in, in Europe, have some sort of ID with a chip on it, which basically has the digital signing uh, functionality. The only problem is it's not properly used. Um, and, and with that card, which has one part of the key and the pin, just to be put things very simply, you can create a very, very long key, which is safe enough uh, to be considered to be your ID. Just like showing this ID to a civil servant or, or anyone for that matter, this is your ID, you don't have to show up, you just need internet connection. Now, next level from that is having the same functionality built into your mobile phone, because as you know, most of the uh, computers today don't anymore have uh, smart card readers. Uh, most of the computing devices as of last year, when smartphones and tablets uh, passed uh, PCs and um, laptops, most of the computing devices don't have any ports that you can stick in uh, something. No USB ports, nothing. So the best thing to do is basically to build it in your smartphone. You have the SIM card, which has one part of the key. Again, the other part is inside your head. And voila, you have an encrypted um, signature or ID. Works very easily. And, and, uh, and with that, uh, well, all my colleagues were extremely surprised when I told that when I was in office as prime minister of the country, easily 95% of the signatures I gave with that device. I used my pen only for ceremonial reasons. If you go to you know, visit Talia Gribaskaita, she offers the honor to write in guest book, then you of course need your pen. You cannot do that with your mobile ID, it would be not so polite and not so ceremonial. Now, this is how sensitive data is kept in most cases. Um, that's an actual picture of an actual health data in one country. I don't mention the country because you know, I don't want to uh, um, humiliate anyone, but that's a really existing country and that's how health data is kept. And unfortunately, this is you know, not the only case where, where it's kept this way. Obviously, uh, you can do better, but the main um, question often asked is, you know, but if we digitize health data, like have this kind of you know, patient portal or something like that, where you enter all the health data in one system, is it safe? And I would kind of in invite you to do think about it. Which way it's more safe? To keep it there, where let's say a janitor can go and see, okay, where is this football player's health data? Let's see if I have something interesting. Let's say if I can sell it to the tabloid and then put it back and afterwards, you know, nobody knows who actually looked at it. By the way, this is exactly what happened with Michael Schumacher. He was treated in a very, very prominent clinic in, in Switzerland and, and during he, the first uh, weeks of his um, uh, being there, uh, somebody went to a cellar of the hospital, looked at this paper health data and leaked what actually had happened to, to Michael Schumacher, what was his uh, medical condition. And obviously that was a huge violation of the privacy. Whereas, yes, in theory, if something is digital, it can already also be broken. Uh, I guess I'm not kind of lying too much if I say that new technology is 100% uh, foolproof. But if you compare a properly uh, safeguarded um, uh, technology or, or IT system with uh, something that's on paper, I would always choose the uh, ICT version of, of, of keeping things safe. By the way, in Estonia, we use blockchain to, to keep the data integrity of the health data and, and that's actually hugely helpful for, for quite many years already. Um, now, to answer the questions that most of the citizens would have in this case, e and how to make sure that nobody violates uh, your privacy, our solution has been that we make it visible for the citizen himself. So basically, if you are a patient, at any time you can see who has looked at your health data, and if you see some doctor snooping around there, you can press charges. End of story. And of course, if doctors know that, they don't snoop around. Even if you give uh, 
it has sometimes gone so bad that even if you go give an oral permission, they still require you to do it in some sort of written form. You know, please send me an email that you allow me to look at it because they, they are afraid to be prosecuted. So you can be quite sure that your data is actually much safer than on, on paper. Now, there are companies that actually can make a lot of sense of that data. For, for example, like health data, I will bring you just, as we are in Lithuania, I will start with a Lithuanian example called Limpo. Every day, you co collect uh, data about your health, right? When you go running, there is probably something on you that collects the data. When you go um, do any, any kind of exercise, you probably use a pulsometer, you probably uh, measure how many steps you take, that data is there. Now, the only thing the watch itself can generate from that is average heart rate and perhaps you know, saying something about your condition. Now, whereas there is so much data, uh, it's, it's also very important that um, that you start making sense of that. And not only by companies like, like Limpo, whose um, uh, main focus is, is uh, to use the fitness data uh, to, uh, for greater good, the, your own uh, condition to, to improve it, to provide you with challenges, but also for, uh, for uh, getting kind of this big data and, and make, it, make sense of that, but also uh, public uh, health data. If you start to think about it, if every doctor enters your health data to the information system, how much actually the government, or not the, actually the government, but the insurance fund could know about people's behavior? Uh, they don't need to look at my personal health data. It's enough if they look at the demographics. 35 to 40 male population, how many of them go to region, uh, like uh, regular checks? And they find out, okay, there is uh, like those guys who are between 30 to 35, they go just well, but for some reason from 35 to 40 people don't go to medical checks. What could they do? They could easily run a campaign and, and uh, you know, improve all of our health. Uh, today, my ar argument is most of that data that is gathered is, and, and this is gathered as we speak all the time, is not properly utilized. And, and when we think where the world is going with artificial in intelligence, uh, with Internet of Things, there will be so much more data gathered. And of course, I would argue that uh, for greater good, we should uh, find ways to utilize it uh, much better than we already do. Now, as you have probably noticed by now, I like pictures of myself, so here's one. Uh, can you guess what I'm doing on this picture? Take a wild guess. Sorry? No, this is, this is public service I'm using. This is, the cr this is the most unlikely public service you would use digitally in the world. Voting, exactly. Uh, signing a law I would do the same way, except I would uh, use my cell phone. Uh, but yeah, that's, that's a good guess. I was signing laws uh, on a weekly basis, also like that. But here, you know, the, there's a mic from, uh, from a TV station that hints that there is actually a lot of journalists around, and that was me voting for the parliamentary elections in 2015. Now, I have been told that e-voting cannot possibly be secure. And I kind of agree uh, on many cases. Because if you think that e-voting is a jukebox that you introduce in front of the polling booth and, and people go there and, you know, press some buttons and then it's somehow electronic, yeah, that's not safe. I, I wouldn't do that. I, I, I definitely wouldn't touch that system. Um, e-voting or internet voting can only be safe if you have proper digital ID. And then I would argue it is actually safer than voting on paper. And, uh, if we have time later, I could, you know, talk to any one of you why I think that. But the point is, voting uh, is probably the most unlikely thing to be done digitally. And we have uh, done it ever since 2005. And let me tell you, it works just fine. In 2015, in those elections, that was the last parliamentary election in Estonia so far, 
every third vote was casted online. Which means also that if there is an Estonian citizen living in Vilnius, you would usually go to the embassy. But if you live in Kaunas, let's say, which is the second biggest city here in, in, uh, in Lithuania, you don't have an Estonian embassy there because, you know, we're we not the, that big country. We don't, have, we, we don't have the money to have so many embassies. So if an Estonian living in Kaunas wants to vote, voila, you only need the internet connection, and that's not that difficult. So last time, from 116 different countries, the votes came in, and it worked very easy. And of course, the peak uh, or the, the kind of positive thing for politicians is that they get this result of this one-third of votes immediately after the uh, uh, polling has ended. So, so basically at uh, around 9 o'clock in the evening during uh, those elections, I already knew that, okay, fine, I can continue in my office. <laughs> so, that, you know, but, but that's not the reason why we do it. Now, again, a picture of me. This is the one of the two public services that you cannot use uh, electronically. You have to show up. Um, but uh, <laughs> that's a picture of, of last August. Uh, I will have my first anniversary soon. I hope <laughs> still. Uh, and uh, and I, I, didn't, I didn't mind showing up. So, you know, even in Estonia, we haven't, if anyone tells you that in Estonia they have digitized 100% of the public services, sorry, they are lying. Getting married is something you have to show up for. Uh, for, that, for that matter, the other one uh, is not that important. Uh, it's much less risky transaction. It's uh, selling or buying uh, real estate. So there you have to show up as well. You have to meet your notarius. But I think this is by far the riskiest transactions. That's why you need to show up. Uh, now, good news. Those of you who don't have your digital, I know many of you have. Uh, Estonia is not the only country uh, in the world that has that. Many of you have your own digital ID. Those of you who don't, the good news is you can apply for one. You know, in the front row, we have at least one year resident, probably more. And, and the trick is that when you apply for it, you can uh, you know, do a contract with any Estonian, sign it digitally using email, uh, quite easy. Or uh, what the, it's mostly used for, we have currently 40,000 plus e-residents globally. Most of them have used it uh, when they need to run a company in Estonia. So there are many reasons to do that. I'm not here to talk about taxation and, and the business climate. That's beyond the point. But if you want to run a company in Estonia or you have, a let's say, a board, sheet th a board seat there, you want to sign a document once in a while, you know, e-residency card is something you could uh, easily consider. That's it. I hope I uh, made you imagine a bit how much we could uh, change the world if not only, you know, here and there we would have public services digitized, but if we would have both public and private services taken to, you know, today it's iPhone, in five years, it might be something totally different. But point being, taking the, the services to digital world saves time, makes public sector much more effective, uh, saves on corruption, by the way. Let, let me tell you just a final story, I promise. In, <laughs> if, if you come to Lithuania, which is uh, like by business culture, a very Nordic country, here you say, you cannot bribe a computer. Everybody is like, oh, yes, we can make it more effective. There are some countries, obviously, not, not far from us as well, uh, when you say that you cannot bribe a computer and the audience goes, hmm. <laughs> so, you know, wh whatever is the, the take on that, it's just a fact that uh, when you use computers, there is so much uh, less um, uh, room for human error there is so much less uh, uh, room for um, kind of um, partiality. And of course, partiality can be sometimes uh, corrupt. So I think ultimately, as citizens, we want uh, uh, quality public services and, and we want uh, uh, less corruption and, and more efficiency.
So with that, I, I end. If any one of you has any questions, please don't hesitate to contact me in LinkedIn or Twitter or tavi at trivas.ee, which is not that difficult to remember. Thank you very much. All right, everybody, uh, we're going to have a panel discussion now, uh, talking through some of these topics uh, that we've just talked about uh, in a little more detail, or maybe more general. Uh, All right. I'll, I'll take that one. Okay. okay. Hi. <laughs> so, my name is Ron Kreitzer, I'm with Pillar Project, I'm one of the system architects here, and one of the things uh, a lot of people probably on the Pillar Project don't even know was one of the long-term goals for me when I got involved in this was looking at how technology can impact government and how to make government better. And that was a really long-term thing I want to see, and I'm really excited about this area. So um, let me talk a little bit about who we have on the panel today. Uh, we just heard from Tavi, so um, I don't think anybody walked in new, but ex-Prime uh, Minister of Estonia, uh, Kalia was, thank you, identity woman. She just had a talk on digital identity and the new standards coming out with identity. And then we have uh, Daniel Barr over here with, um, from the Tensorium Project, uh, and he was had some talks earlier. I don't know how many people got into that. Uh, also a workshop yesterday. So welcome panelists, and I get the fun uh, opportunity here of asking questions. Hmm. Excellent. And the title of this is Digital Identity and How It Might Change Government. And I went on a slightly different tangent um, to make maybe make it a little more fun here. Uh, and I've got a little more high-level questions, which I think should be fun. So let me, uh, let me start off and um, see what you guys think about this. Um, right now, it's been said that we've, we have the ability right now, or the opportunity right now, to change the world with the technology that's currently available to us, blockchain and other things. But we need to get it right, because there's a chance we could get it wrong, and that could have some dire impacts. So the question for the panelists, do you think we can get it right? And what is your view of right? Good one. <laughs> <laughs> Would you like to start? Yes, sure. So I think that we must get it right, because now is the time that we're establishing the future of the decentralized internet. Um, we kind of had the chance to do it 20, 30 years ago, and um, maybe missed a few things on the way and compromised for the sake of efficiency and commercial uh, ideas. I think that... Um, what we can establish now that um, blockchain technologies and decentralized technologies, more broadly speaking, is just kind of up and coming, is um, we need to have like laser focus on self-sovereignty. That if we're only thinking of blockchain, crypto, and all that as like fun tokens that um, that suddenly like take uh, all sorts of activities that we do online and tokenize it and we completely forget about the self-sovereign individual, we'll definitely not get it right. So I think that it's very important to kind of remain loyal to the ethos. It's funny, we have actually Vinay is one of, uh, one of the guys that uh, inspired me in uh, the whole cypherpunk culture. I think that it's very important to remain loyal to the ethos of um, what brought us to those technologies, the cypherpunk roots and all that, so that whatever it is that we're developing, we're developing it around people and like giving power to the people first and building things from there. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I mean, I think um, the roots that I spoke about are actually in civil society, um, which is like how do we really empower human beings in our local communities to connect to each other and not be intermediated by large entities, be it be governments or large corporations that are running our social universes now, right? Like, my neighborhood should have its own little server where I connect my neighbors. 
that is accountable to us because we set it up and now we're using our self-sovereign identities to connect. So I think, um, and I, I think one of the places where we, we go off track in terms of where we could go wrong is like, I keep hearing the conversation, well, what's the new Facebook gonna be? Like, no, like, you don't need that architecture anymore. So we have to like reprogram how we think about what, what decent, decentralized doesn't mean nobody talks to anybody. That would be ultimately, it's, it's networked and connected and that power is, and the, and the potential to connect people doesn't have to be at the scale of one company connecting everybody, mm -hmm. but local nodes and tools. And we also have to think about the business models that enable resourcing of those local things. Right? And we need capital structures that also enable that. We can't just, if all our capital structures are, are oriented towards like centralization mm -hmm. and we keep using those models, we're not going to have a decentralized future either. So there's a lot of paths that we could go wrong. We have to stay connected to what's the ultimate architecture we want and how do we get there from here. Well, the emerge of, of blockchain technology and um, artificial intelligence is, in my opinion, at least uh, as big of a revolution as, as the emerge of internet, probably bigger. And the sooner we realize that, uh, the better. And of course, um, I don't think there it will be realized at every point of the globe um, at the same time. So those countries or those societies or those teams, business teams, that realize it sooner, well, they will win, and they might win very big. Uh, my, my second hat today is actually being a proud member of a um, board at uh, Blockchain Center Vilnius, and, and one of our key tasks there is to educate people to understand the enormous potential of both blockchain and artificial intelligence, and, and I, I think you know, once you start thinking about it, there is no question whether it will happen or, or, or how much it will happen, the question is, uh, will we be smart enough to take full advantage of it uh, already? Or will we will be doing it in a few years when somebody else has been you know, way behind, or, or way ahead. So uh, I think getting things um, right, in, in especially this technology, is uh, understanding that it is happening, and no politician can prohibit it, uh, uh, they can help to enable it, but they cannot prohibit it. And uh, yeah, those business teams who are first, uh, they will win most. That's uh, quite quite logical to my. That sounds great. Um, and we've touched upon this a little bit, uh, but you know, I tend to like to think of myself as an optimist. But let's take a little pessimistic point of view here, and we've touched on it just a little bit. But if we don't get it wrong, and you know, you mentioned governments, you know, can help pave the way for some of it. But what happens if they resist, or you know, what happens if we go down the wrong path? What does that path look like? I mean, I've heard, I've read stuff that doesn't sound good at all. I mean, is that overhyped, or are there really some things we need to worry about now if it goes down a wrong path and we use that technology, AI, et cetera, for something else? Well, one of the temptations, if I may start, uh, that governments have is, uh, while not fully understanding how, how things actually work in, in, in blockchain, they, they always start to think, okay, blockchain, this is, you know, crypto money, which means there is something, you know, that we don't understand, so it means that there is something shady in it. And, and they will uh, immediately link, uh, uh, it, it happens with central bankers sometimes, it happens with governments, they will link um, blockchain to uh, money laundering, which uh, I would argue is way less likely to happen than with something green that is produced in, uh, in US and it's called US dollars. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's, if I would want to, I, I honestly, I, I don't want to, but if I would like to launder some money, I would not choose, uh, choose uh, uh, transaction of, of any cryptocurrency because that is ultimately traceable still or it's, I, I don't see the, the way I, I could actually utilize the, the uh, currency without identifying myself at the end. Uh, I would use cash. I would use US dollars. Privacy so tokens also, but yeah. Yeah, but, but, uh, <laughs> but still, you know, probably you, you might know how to do it, but I honestly don't know how to actually 
uh, use that money for any kind of everyday community or, mm. or how to change it to fiat or how to pay with it without identifying mm. myself uh, in the hotel. So, so for me, you know, it's, it's kind of useless to get huge property for, uh, that I cannot actually use. Yeah. And, and, and uh, I think uh, one, of, one of the big parts that we need to educate the decision makers, and, and now I make a very dangerous point by saying that most decision makers uh, in politics in the world, and also perhaps in the banking in the world, haven't thought it through uh, what the opportunity of, of use of blockchain technology actually is, um, if we kind of educate them and if we explain um, that actually also crypto tra transactions can be very transparent, well, then I, I hope we can avoid the wrong path still. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think um, in terms of like governments and identity, um, I think that we have to design systems for individuals, like citizens interacting with their governments very carefully, right? And I'm really excited about the verifiable credentials work that I presented where governments issue claims to individuals in their wallets and then they can present them and wherever they share the credential, they're not calling home to the government to check on it, right? So it's, um, and I'm very, very concerned about designs that I know are being uh, shopped around the world, uh, modeled on the Indian Adhar system, mm -hmm. and specifically a huge number of projects that folks are looking at funding in Africa, right, where we're gonna build interoperable Adhar for all of Africa. Like, wait a second, in that model, the government sees everywhere you go and use your card. Do you really want a file of all that stuff? Now, I get that works in Estonia. You've got 1.5 million people and you have a super accountable government that people trust and believe in and put a lot of um, uh, faith in, in running well and it runs well, right? And I don't know that those models are exportable to the entire rest of the world or appropriate. So we have to innovate, and this is where the verified credentials work, is it kind of provides a way for governments to provide identities to citizens without, um, without some of the privacy issues that arise that may, that, that are there in, in societies that have less of a trust relationship with their government. So that's, that's, that's what I'm really worried about is we're going to build large-scale identity systems that put many people at very high risk for bad things happening to them. I think um, like what uh, if we're thinking about the pessimistic view as mm -hmm. you started, um, then basically we can try to illustrate a dystopian scenario of where we're headed with this technology, which is quite easy to uh, uh, imagine for anyone who read some sci-fi and stuff like that. So um, right now, with just how the internet is working before blockchain, we already have basically um, surveillance capitalism systems, right? Yeah. So everything is about the ad business model prostitution of uh, personal data to, uh, to uh, all kind of commercial uses. Um, and then we have already, like we're quite familiar with social networks, for example, so a lot of forms of very primitive, but forms of tokenizations like likes, shares, and stuff, right? The moment you start actually programming it into different kind of actionable contracts, so like if we completely ignore decentralization and we're only thinking about blockchain technologies from smart contract perspective, then programmable money can result in programmable society, right? You just um, start, start developing this totally um, surveillance capitalism driven um, economy and design all kind of financial games around different incentives, it does not necessarily have to be for the individual. So like I can imagine a scenario where everyone is being rewarded for particular uh, behavior and the dictators of those games are not necessarily democratized. Um, that's totally something that could be much more efficient with smart contract uh, technology rather than the internet as it is now. So this is totally a realistic scenario as well. <laughs> You're not worried at all, huh? Yeah, what could possibly go wrong? Um, I think 
some of you might have touched on just a little bit, but the ability for a government to issue its own digital currency and have all transactions go through that currency for its citizens may be, I would think, would be sort of on the, the wrong path. Any quick yeah. thought on that? So it's a good one. Actually, we were talking to the Reserve Bank of Australia last year. So like in Australia, there's the, the idea, digital Australian dollar discussion going. And like in a way, all governments already have their digital currency, right? It's mm -hmm. just that it's not, um, it's not on a public ledger and it does not really do so much other than injecting more uh, numbers to the system. But the cool thing, like if I, would, like if I were a government, um, I would think of uh, automation of taxation services through uh, digital currency. But I think it's slightly far-fetched for where things are with the um, uh, government sector and how much it is involved in um, capacity to control just every aspect of our life. Yeah, now we're getting into the question, what is money anyways? Um, I'm, I'm interested in how we, um, I think the great thing about the conversations going on around cryptocurrency is like it's making everybody ask what is money, right? And where does it come from? And, and I'm really interested to see what will come of like um, mutual credit clearing networks and systems where we're collaborating together to generate credit to have transactions in our communities. Like fiat currency is like a handy fiction because we make up all this stuff to, to help economies go. And there's other ways to potentially source and manage resource flow that don't involve fiat currency and, and also don't involve our current, um, our current models of cryptocurrency either, like, like Bitcoin, right? So we'll see, it's gonna be interesting. Well, uh, if we wouldn't have the history of having cash, imagine if um, somebody would come to you in 2018 and tell that, um, you know, we created a new system, <laughs> different yeah. shape of, or different uh, numbers on, on paper, they all look almost the same, but they will all have tremendous value and they will exchange hand and they will be very stable. You would probably think that the person would be crazy, right? Um, nevertheless, it has worked uh, for, for quite some time, but of course, cash is um, not only the best uh, uh, case for criminal money, but it is uh, also the least effective way of payment, because you need to meet each other. If I want to buy something from you, I need to meet you, and this is not how it goes in, in today's uh, trade. Now, uh, of course, internet banking is a huge leap forward, uh, in a way, you could argue that it's a bit digital money, but of course, the SIPA payments and, and all the technicality behind that is still hugely ineffective. So the room for trans... Tran tran um, what's the word? There is obviously a room to, uh, to uh, make it much, much better and, and uh, make it faster, make it cheaper, uh, whether it will uh, happen uh, with, with cryptocurrencies, whether there will be um, some cryptocurrencies that are linked to fiat in terms of value, which is for many people uh, uh, still a big issue that, you know, the exchange rate is, is very volatile. That remains to be seen, but, but I, I'm quite certain that uh, the current payment system that doesn't allow you to uh, pay uh, from one bank to another on Sunday that's stupid still. I, I don't think this is the best we can do in 2018. Imagine if that would happen to SMS and, and uh, email. Sorry, <laughs> Saturdays, Sundays, we don't have emails sent. So you can get all the emails Monday morning, nine o'clock. Well, that's not usually how you, how you would, <laughs> would be happy. But with payments, uh, if you want to pay from one bank to another bank, even here in Lithuania, from Sweet Bank to SAB, voila, wait until Monday. So obviously room for, uh, what's the word? Improvement. No, no, there's another word. What, what, is, what is blockchain doing with, uh, or companies with blockchain? Efficiency? 
disruption. 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 That's it. Okay. <laughs> there is a compromise. Thank you. Which thank is you. My English coins. skills. I have been. I'm sorry. I have been uh, two days in in Finland speaking only in Finnish, and my English <laughs> skills are, are getting bad. Thank you for my room for disruption. That was. That was so so the the kind of middle ground compromise that is being uh, like it's quite hot in in the blockchain ecosystem now is stable coins so that people can peg in various forms um, volatile cryptocurrency and enjoy the stable coins but like obviously there are debates on like whether we even need a stable coin or yeah, yeah but, but I think as long as you pay your rent or, or for the potatoes and meat uh, in fiat uh, and, and if you want to get the huge masses to use crypto I think stablecoin would be something that would help, mm. definitely, because uh, today, if you start a conversation with anyone who isn't every day involved in crypto, then the biggest question is, but Bitcoin is going up and down like 10% today, so, you know, if I want to pay my rent, I cannot kind of, you know, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. it's a bit difficult to, to keep uh, your, your savings in that if you, if you have everyday expenses in fiat. Mm. Okay, well, shifting back a little bit more toward government or a lack of government, um, in the early days of crypto, there was a lot of libertarian anarchy views, you know, no government, we can do this all with blockchain. But now as the community expands and we get more, a little more mainstream, what do you think is going to happen with that view? Uh, I think that uh, it's not so much that... Uh this view does not exist or that this view is right or wrong. I think it's just that as the industry grows, we need to be more inclusive of uh, also mainstream uh, ideas. And we basically, like, you can't kind of dismiss or, or already um, announce that it's not relevant, the whole cypherpunk libertarian aspect of it, because um, if you ignore that, then the value of proposition is almost non-existent. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. It's kind of, it's a societal change. It's not just a technology, right? Mm -hmm. um, but being more inclusive to reach mainstream adoption is a, like it's a must, right? And to do that, you have to design the playground such that everyone can, everyone can uh, have, you know, freedom of choice of what technologies they use. Um, access to all of those things should be not only for the tech savvy, so like we need to develop good uh, user experiences, so hopefully Pillar uh, will help on that as well. Like my project is focusing on tackling issues around um, bringing those technologies to mass adoption. So yeah, like all of those things would have to be in place. It's not just uh, libertarian, it's not just uh, mainstream. So uh, so on, on the wall over there is David Snowden and the Kinevin framework and as you were speaking, I was like, oh yeah, David has this saying where he talks about sort of pushes towards anarchy and lawlessness all end up going towards fascism ultimately, mm -hmm. right? So, um, which is sort of interesting given what's happening in the world, but you need to have governance of systems and you need, you need to support systems regulating themselves and functioning in ways that are good for lots of people, at least if we're, if we're talking about mass adoption, right? And the question is, how do, you, how do you get that governance? Governance doesn't just mean, like the, the word governor comes in part when they, they do it in engineering, it's on a steam engine, right? And the, it's, it's, you've got a, a feedback loop on the machine so it keeps running. Mm -hmm. Right, mm -hmm. and those feedback loops aren't necessarily like rules from the outside. They're they're mechanisms within the system as it runs to help it balance and stabilize. Right, and I think we need to think creatively about how we have governance within these systems woven in, and not just think about it as like the government will apply a rule and affect the system. We have to think about the governance of the system as it operates. And, and get an experiment and, and be mindful of how we're building these systems and try them out and adjust and change, mm -hmm. right? Well, I, I think in theory, with, with today's technology already, we could have a vote uh, of all the people living in Lithuania or Estonia or any other country on all the issues. And we could, like, you know, get rid of government and then decide on every issue by a vote. 
But I wouldn't want to have that because uh, I have other things to do in my life than just you know voting on all, mm. all sorts of details of stuff uh, all day long. Yeah. Um, I have seen it myself that uh, uh, chairing a government or, or taking an executive job is more than a full day job. Mm. Uh, and, and you need um, you need to know the details behind every decision. You need to uh, prepare for that. You need experts working for you. So it's you know. It's, it would, wouldn't work to have a referendum on a single issue because it's humanly not possible to be competent in all the issues uh, yep. uh, by yourself without the team that works for the executive arm. Now, having said that, uh, I, I still I, I very much believe in parliamentarism and, and the kind of, you know, let's have some people to, to take care of that and let's then every four years or so um, decide whether they did their job well, whether we fire them or, or re-elect them. But uh, having said that, I think that w where we definitely should use technology much more is getting rid of the bureaucracy part of government. Mm -hmm. uh, and there is still so much of that as well. All sorts of reporting, all sorts of formulas. I mean, there is, I would argue that there is no need for any application by any citizen. We can automize all the services uh, without any kind of formulas uh, that like we are used to in our everyday mm -hmm. lives. Uh, and and uh, this is a huge saving already. And, and that will enable us to have much more effective government. So I, I wouldn't mind that we have like 100 people in the, in the parliament and, and you know 15 uh, uh, taking care of executive branch. We can s have much less uh, civil servants uh, doing this bureaucracy stuff. Okay. Yeah, it's actually important to also notice that like if we get rid of all governments and end up being controlled by an AI, one government and stuff like that, it's not much better. <laughs> so, yeah. so like I, I, I also agree that like there should be some form of like community mm -hmm. emergent form of governance, could be a parliamentary, could be complementary to also um, different communities that emerge online. Like this is something that we already have before blockchain as well. Yeah. But, but of course, having said that, I think it's, especially for small communities where there is a decision like uh, you know, whether we should build a new yacht harbor or new kindergarten, you could you know, time to time ask the community and oh, it yeah. is much cheaper when you use the electronic channels than, than having the paper referendums which mm -hmm. are hugely expensive. So since we're on the topic of democratic technologies, I wanna throw in a case for um, deliberative processes that really invite the wisdom of uh, the people involved. And a great example in the identity space is the province of British Columbia rolled out a new citizen services card. And it's gonna, it works for the healthcare system and as a driver's license, both. And in developing the system, there was a bunch of questions about what future uses could be for the card and how the system back end would work and how citizens' privacy would be protected. And so they convened 36 randomly selected citizens from throughout the province. They came together for two weekends, were briefed on the system and how it worked, and then deliberated and made policy recommendations to government. And that's all published in a report for anyone in the province to see, including like who were these citizens that sort of thought on your behalf about these questions, right? Mm -hmm. And that's a way to do democracy without voting. And there's a whole community focused on innovative processes in that realm <laughs> called the National Coalition for Dialogue and Deliberation, where these practices are documented and shared, and you can apply them to all sorts of things, right? So we have to get out of like, a, like we're, it's all about new mental models. Like, how do we do things in new ways that still get us democracy? And democracy is not just voting. Very good. Mm. No. Sounds like you, you can, you can go look online about how they did it. It was very, it was very cool. Okay, fantastic. Well, we've been talking about the practical aspects of voting, which was my next question. So thank you for answering that <laughs> without even me prompting. Um, so I was wanting to talk about the practical aspects, which we did, and then a little bit more theoretical with voting. Um, do you think voting is a last century approach to solving some of these problems? <laughs> and you know, is that the best way to manage a democracy in this century? Wow. Yeah, it's a good and one. And we've I got would, a politician I would actually in the room, like so this hear, is gonna be. I would like to hear. Um, yeah. Yeah. yeah, I yeah. think, uh, I think uh, uh, what we have in, in politics is uh, just like in the society we have 
good guys, bad guys, smart guys, stupid guys, everything. Um, and um, I have never seen an ideal parliament that, uh, there where everybody is, you know, the smartest hundred people of the of the country or, or the least corrupt hundred people of the country. This has never happened. And, and probably it could, could never happen because uh, people, you know, are free to choose whomever they want to represent them. And, and some of them vote for populists. And, and, you know, even though I don't like that at all and I don't like where it's taking our, our society against fr liberal democracy and everything, uh, or like you know, opposing liberal democracy or challenging it, um, I th still think that people should have the right to be mistaken as well. So, so I, I don't think uh, if we kind of end up with, with bad results, sometimes we, we should uh, uh, blame the system. I think we should perhaps, um, you know, try to try to be smarter next time. Or, or um, I don't know. I think uh, in parliamentary democracy as it has been often said, is no, no ideal, but it's still the best we have invented so far. So, yeah. But it's definitely not perfect. I, I, I'm not naive in that. Mm -hmm. uh, in, in Australia, we have this uh, party, started by friends of mine, actually, called Flux Party. They're also working on various, like, blockchain voting systems. And their model is uh, issue-based direct democracy. The idea is to basically get elected to the parliament, and then they give their electorate um, the right to basically issue their own, like submit their own, um, their own votes, but also they can uh, delegate it to subject matter experts from their, uh, from their uh, peers or whatever. Of course, that it's a bit, uh, a bit new agey and stuff, but in Australia, cool things happen, so <laughs> <laughs> maybe, maybe it will take off eventually. <laughs> so far, uh, unfortunately, they didn't get elected yet. Um, but yeah, there, there are many different, like I have a friend who's working on a liquid-based democracy, which I think there was a which talk. Which we just heard, yeah, this afternoon, yeah. 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 yeah I, like I said, I'm really excited about deliberative democratic processes and what they can bring us, because we've, you know, voting is an amazing technology. It's about, you know, uh, uh, you know, the... The U.S. Constitution, you know, is 300 years, you know, I don't know exactly. It's like 300 years old. We've been doing this thing. It's great technology. It's also 300 years old. We could use some updating. So let's try some stuff. Like, Well, just what, one thing that came uh, to my mind where um, democracy is um, inefficient, of course, is, is executive de decision making. Uh, because uh, sometimes the smartest things that need to be done, some sort of uh, reform, some sort of uh, technological innovation to be introduced, they might not be popular. And, and w if you have every four years a job interview uh, as a politician, doesn't matter if you're president or prime minister or, or parliamentarian, you will have the job interview. Then you kind of think all the time, how do I perform? And um, for some aspects, it's very good, because if you do a shitty job, you will be fired. And, and this is how it should be. There has to be measurement, there has to be kind of possibility to fire you. But on the other hand, of course, uh, uh, it is less effective, and, and you are afraid of things sometimes. So, yeah, in an ideal world, we would have, you know, good politicians that are enlightened and, and who are not afraid of taking unpopular decisions when they believe that this is for the greater good. This is kind of the, you know, Churchill model, either you lead or you follow. And, uh, and uh, to have more leaders in politics is, is obviously a necessity. I think, I think something else is going on that hasn't really been named, which is people are becoming much, well, at least some people are becoming more global and less attached to where mm -hmm. they're from. And like, how do we, what does governance look like then when I spend four months a year in three different countries? Right, and you have a business uh, and in like, a couple of them. Yeah. Like, there's a kind of, I think, you know, and I think ultimately some of these technologies are disruptive to our current political construction of the nation state as the center of everything. 
Um, and we have major commons resource issues on the planet, right? Like how do we manage water? How do we stop carbon emissions? Like these aren't like solvable even at the nation state level and even at the size of countries like India and China, right? Like there's a billion people. We're like, okay, we still can't solve the problem. So we have sort of on the planet sort of meta governance issues that will either sink or swim all of humanity. And it's gonna be an interesting, interesting to see how, how all this stuff plays out in the next mm. 100 years. Mm. You think it's going to be 100 years? Or well, do you I don't think, know. We'll you get think things the will happen answer a lot faster. of, like, did we succeed? Yeah. Or, I mean, it's going to, like, you know, you, un, you overestimate the immediate change and you underestimate the long-term change of these. We need, to, we need to come here back in, in 100 years and, and yeah, <laughs> check it out. Yeah, check it out how it has gone. <laughs> An okay. idea for Pillar 100 conference. Yeah, we'll okay. reconvene when we are, our minds are transcended to AI oh, realm. No, stop. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, coming back to um, Kalia uh, touched on this a little bit about um, ways that citizens can get involved in their government or in community, if you don't want to say government per se. But, you know, what are better ways um, for the citizens to get involved in the decision making process of the things that affect them? Well, I'm super psyched about the decentralization to enable new platforms for people to connect with each other, right? I think there's been an underestimation of how many people aren't engaged in Facebook and other things like that. And for those who are there, the mistrust that's there and the, you know, a user interface designed to drive attention clicks is not one that's designed to support um, healthy communities, right? So now that we have the capacity for people to own their own digital identifiers, now we can see potentially hundreds of thousands of flowers bloom in terms of tools and platforms and uh, uh, tools and, and places to connect with each other that are different and that really empower people. I'm tired of being asked to join a Facebook group to talk to you know, people working together on Project X, Y, or Z. I'm like, yeah, it's private, but Facebook sees everything. Like, are you kidding me? <laughs> like, it's just yeah. broken. You, you should speak Estonian there, then you know, Facebook <laughs> guys have difficulties in understanding probably. But. Yes, okay, well, I'm sure their AIs yeah, are smart enough to is. see it, to speak <laughs> but I mean, Estonian. Trying to, trying to uh, argue a bit, uh, it, it doesn't have to be, of course, um, uh, Facebook, but, but some sort of um, uh, either social media or, or, uh, or uh, kind of um, also you know, for business context, LinkedIn, or, or I think uh, those, those things have actually, um, especially in smaller communities, have brought people closer to each other. Yeah. It's, it's so easy, you know, any one of you who want to contact me, just send me a message in LinkedIn, and yeah. you will find me there, and I will actually answer to you. Um, and uh, if you have, a, like, a small town of, let's say, I don't know, 50,000 people, uh, I would bet that the mayor would be very smart to, to check uh, his whatever Facebook or, or whatever uh, social media that is popular in this region account regularly, and, and see what people are saying there, yeah. and and, uh, and respond to them, mm -hmm. and and uh, that you know I, I wouldn't even mind that this discussion between me and my voters, uh, if I'm politician, is seen by anyone. It is it can be fully public there. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not only seen by Facebook, but for the for the wider audience. But it can be a very good method of um, of getting feedback. Uh, of course, again arguing a bit with myself is that with all those either social media but also demonstrations on the street, you always have the risk that there is this very noisy minority mm -hmm. that will um, create this uh, picture that uh, you know, things are like, <laughs> they, like they are, but, but the, as the majority who thinks otherwise is keeping silent. But you, know, you sometimes have to take that risk. Yeah. I think that uh, a lot of how um, people can get involved, ideally, in an ideal scenario, how people can get involved in um, governance. Uh, inspiration that we can take is open source culture, right? So like when, when you're working on open source, so of course right now it's mainly in the realm of the geeks and stuff, 
But when you're working on open source, then you have, you're encouraging involvement of the community and you can post issues, you can um, uh, post bounties, you can basically open source the process for how you make things. It's not just about code base, right? So if we can, like this is something that I used to tell the bank people when we were working with them that eventually if you are not going to open source the bank, so there will be like an alternative for that. Like the way I see it is the more like open systems eventually win, right? Like proprietary systems, closed systems, they end up kind of, um, it's the eggshell security model. Uh, you have some kind of very um, uh, nice looking shell, but actually like the moment you kind of hack the system and we've seen it with elections in US or anywhere else if you're not as naive. Um, basically, if you game the system, you don't need to work so hard. But when it's something more organic that kind of encourages participation, like active participation from the community, then uh, people can have direct influence. And from the government perspective, mm -hmm. I think that uh, just, like, just like you mentioned, it would be cool if the government would stay in, in tune to what people are up to these days and kind of try to catch up faster than uh, when they just have to. Like I, right now, it's, uh, the response from government is only when they really, really have to. Like you see uh, 15 years after the fact with Facebook, uh, people are upset about the business model that was like there from the get-go. So, yeah. Um, the sometimes, best sometimes I say I was against Facebook from before it ever existed, right? Like <laughs> the ASN paper was published in 2003. It says people need to own their own identities, so we can have thousands of these things, and then you get to port your identity around with you, right? Mm. Like, yeah. So, yeah, but like even. But it was so obvious. Like I'm like, how come everybody's just figuring out how like bad this is now? <laughs> even not just for or against, just like be aware of it. You know, like right? The yeah. government should be aware of um, what people want, what people need, mm. what people are using, uh, where things flow. Um, there, there are many different aspects. There. Well, one one different arm that government has actually, in addition to decision making, is offering public services. And what Dubai is actually doing, and in my opinion, it's very cool, is giving you the opportunity to give stars, like feedback. I mean, mm -hmm. just like with Uber and Taxify. Uh, in Estonia, in our experience, the quality of, of taxi service improved a lot after uh, Taxify with, and then the Uber introduced uh, the opportunity to give from one to five stars to the taxi driver. Mm -hmm. they, all of a sudden became polite to me. They said hello, <laughs> they said goodbye, um, voila, it works. And imagine if you can do the same thing you know, on every public service. You, might, it might, it, you don't need to interact with anyone, you just you know, declare your taxation online and, and something is not working, you are not happy with that. One star, there it is. And you can explain why it was one star. And that's... Uh, the uh, best way of actually giving feedback, and then if, if government takes it seriously, just like uh, I would argue the, the um, uh, Uber and, and Taxify take, but also like TripAdvisor, and then all sorts of uh, mm -hmm. measurements are there in the private sector. If that would happen in the public sector as well, like, okay, the doctor wasn't uh, you know, treating me right, I give him two stars. Um, eventually, you will have like two star, three star, five star uh, services. and, and uh, I don't know. It, it looks quite quite uh, interesting what Dubai is doing, and I think we, sh we should at least test it. Mm. Cool. And that's great. That leads perfectly into the last question I have for everybody. Um, what are th what innovative things are you seeing out there that you would say, "Wow, you know, people need to look at this more." I mean, we've touched on some of them, but mm -hmm. let's just end it on a positive note here. With hey, there's some cool stuff out there, and these yeah. people are really. It's a good one. I think that we have a lot of stuff to do and there's like, I, I actually want to become an e-resident so I'll, we have team building plan to uh, go drive to Canberra to get our e-residency. I think this is one really cool thing that Estonia has done. Um, other than that, I also see, um, uh, just recently I joined in New Zealand, there is an um, entrepreneur uh, visa program. So they kind of try to, uh, to bring uh, people that want to create meaningful global impact, right? So you see all kind of initiatives that are kind of trying to transcend beyond uh, the border. I think those things are very progressive. Those things, I wish to see more of that. Um, obviously, there is some 
like commercial benefits to to countries that are trying to do it. But I think beyond that, the societal impact uh, of that should also be like sh we should develop frameworks for that um, from the government level and like to to include community participation in those programs. Um, I'm really excited about the verifiable credentials work that's been picked up by um, particularly the province of British Columbia for issuing verifiable credentials or working on it. And, and you can see all their code on GitHub actually to um, small businesses in the province for all the licensing and stuff. Um, and then um, and then overall, like the Canadians specifically in their organization, the Digital Identity and Authentication Council of Canada is driving a bunch of innovation um, and looking very seriously at the verifiable credentials models for, for that country. So we'll see um, what happens. I think they're like a, they're a, an interesting bridge if we get those open standards to happen is that you know, governments have a role as authoritative sources of certain things about their citizens, and that maybe over time other things will be sources of similar authority, you know, things, and that ultimately it could be disruptive. But for now, it's like a path. Like, as long as, long as we have governments are the only thing that can issue these credentials about us, we're sort of stuck. And until they're issued in a digitally native form, we can't have something else do it too. So uh, we'll see where it goes, but I'm excited. At least we can issue money ourselves, right? Well, yeah, in theory. Uh, it's also it's it's so fun. Point. It's yeah, a starting yeah, yeah. point. Yeah. <laughs> Very good. Good point. Well, um, I think the best public services we are getting from the government are those that we don't even um, notice. Or, or um, I, I, We have some experiences around the world where you don't need to apply for service uh, in order the service to happen to you. For example, you know, when a child is born, ultimately you should be asked two things. First of all, what is the name? Because this is your decision, uh, together with your wife, obviously. And, or, okay, let's be honest, it's your wife's decision. But, uh, <laughs> uh, but uh, the name, and then um, at which uh, bank account or, or crypto account or whatever account you want to have your child subsidies and, and all these things you are entitled to. That's it. All other things should be automized, uh, including the fact that this child is registered to live with you. Uh, and only if there is kind of, I don't know what kind of extreme situation, there will be an exception. But other than that, that should be all automized, or, or taxation. I mean, if you, I, I, I don't think we will have cash around for a long time uh, anymore. So, so ultimately, you could be able to opt for taxation that happens automatically in a way, or, or if at least you, you know, you have a con con like account which is linked to your business that can automatically uh, be, be taxed if necessary. So I think these kind of things, uh, some of them are already there, but I think, uh, I hope to see much more of them, and, and uh, I still believe that people have better things to do than, uh, you know, go to different government offices for things they call public services. Definitely. Okay. Well, I think with that, let's uh, wrap up this part. We'll open it for questions. But first, let's thank our panelists. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, uh, get the microphone out here. I know we touched a lot of things, but this questions, I think, will be interesting here. Hi. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> Thank you again. My question is to Mr. Oivas regarding Estonia. As I know, it's really a very successful experience with this digitalization of fabric services, and I know many other countries came to learn from your experience in Estonia, but as far as I see, not many governments implement actually these uh, technologies after the visit, uh, including, for example, German visit and, and other countries. My question, the first question, why, in your opinion, is happening? And the second question maybe is more related to blockchain. What is the way of Estonia uh, for legislation in blockchain uh, field? Uh, maybe following Lithuanian legislation or guidelines or Malta legislation in the field, mm -hmm. if any, in your opinion, legislation is going to happen. Thank you. Well, first of all, blockchain is, uh, there's so many aspects to that. For, uh, we use it uh, as a government for uh, safeguarding some of the governmental data uh, to, just to see that the kind of 
nobody, nobody meddles with it. But uh, there are other tasks, of course, like uh, ICO legislation, where I would argue we are still about to kind of make sense what, what we want to achieve. Um, I think uh, what is good is that we are very closely following what, what Lithuania is doing, and, and in many aspects I would argue that Lithuania, especially when, when it comes to, to blockchain, is, is a bit, bit ahead. I know some Lithuanians argue otherwise, but I think uh, there is a healthy competition, uh, and, and there needs to be. Uh, so when I joined the board of, of um, uh, the Blockchain Center Vilnius, uh, some comments by the journalists were like uh, jealous that you know you have turned to the other side, even though I think actually it's uh, it's we have side. to work together and and uh, and, and uh, make sense of that and be you know in our part of the world be among the first to actually utilize that technology uh, in terms of um, not over-regulating it but but you know having some stability that if you start if you have an ICO in Estonia or Lithuania you want to know that it, it's not banned in like one year or something. So you want stability, you want clarity, and you want to do it properly by the book. That's, that's our experience. <clears throat> uh, the second question about um, why other governments are hesitating. First of all, many uh, countries in the world have digital identities, uh, but usually why it is uh, not uh, widely used is the, in my opinion, false assumption that if something is digital, it is automatically pr more prone to risks. I would argue that it, at 10 cases out of 10, a paper signature is less secure than digital signature. Uh, I think if we put back on screen my uh, handwritten signature, 95% of you can uh, uh, write it and, and uh, we can have a, you know, somebody as a test person and they would not make the difference. So it's so easy to falsify. It's so easy to, to lose something on paper. And, and on digital, you simply have to design the system right. Uh, why it hasn't happened, I think, in essence, um, in public service and in politics, sometimes you are in office longer if you don't do reforms. Uh, and sometimes politicians want to stay in office longer. Can I just add on, I think, I was involved with the U.S. government's national strategy for trusted identities in cyberspace for three years. Um, the scale of the problem in a country the size of the United States is huge, right? And one reason Canada is having success is that it has three telcos, five banks, 14 jurisdictions, really 10 of them. Okay, so like you can get that number of people in a room and start talking about the problem and solving it, right? The US, you have 50 states. I don't even know how many banks, like 24,000 of them. And, you know, 40 telcos or something. Like, so you can't all get in a room and solve the problem, right? So we're gonna see this stuff. Um, different scale systems can can ha have different capacity to solve from complexity, right? And it's not an accident that Estonia oh. solved for it. It's little, so it can solve the problem, right? So. Yeah, but, but on the other hand, uh, we, we do have the standard called credit card. Everybody uses that. And I, by, I don't think it's an ideal standard, you know, but, but it's there. But moving money around is so much easier than moving identity data. M money is just like numbers, right, and accounts. And it's, it's all a common Still unit. Still good to have bigger numbers, though. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But if you lose I mean, some of those numbers, you might be so. But I, th I mean, uh, the models that I think that the the models that are looking like they may have success globally right now are are ones that echo credit card networks, right? So these these sort of um, large scale um, networks of people agreeing to common standards for the identity information. These are also called trust frameworks, okay. and, okay, but, and we'll but see. In, in U.S. or any other, like, okay, let's take U.S., for example. Uh, they have 350 million people, yeah. and, and they somehow they manage to get in the same room or, or uh, do it some other way to introduce passports. They have passports, and everybody... Passports are... Yeah, a, pa this so is there's, ID. there's great history of how that came to be, right? And, and something like 10% of Americans have them. They are not a universal form mm. of ID in the way that they are in Europe. Okay. Because 
Americans don't go anywhere. They stay at home. <laughs> They're boring. They have good food, McDonald's and stuff. Yeah, good food. <laughs> That's great. Anyways, let's have another question. Yeah, any other questions? Uh, Daffy, uh, you're touched a uh, sh short, short period of time, actually, not really related to this, but you texted uh, about taxation. And I was wondering how you, how you think of, uh, of implementing that, because uh, especially if you have uh, a cryptocurrency wallet and, and that cryptocurrency wallet will be anonymous, how can you tax, uh, how can you tax that and how can you automate that? Mm -hmm. Just wondering. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, I think uh, in, in most cases, uh, if you want to change the cryptocurrency to fiat, uh, I think it's not the unique to Estonia, then you will uh, either tax uh, the gains or uh, if, if you, in Estonian case, if you uh, change to fiat uh, and, and it's your company, uh, your company only uh, is taxed when you take the money out of the company. So, so I, I think it's quite simple actually to, to tax it, but as, as long as the, the, it remains in crypto, it's not taxed by, according to our law and, and uh, you can, you can uh, keep, keep it there. Uh, but uh, automatic taxation is, uh, you know, we, we cannot have it uh, for all of your accounts. But I, I will give you just an example. We had a problem uh, of, um, uh, or a debate, whether we should allow Uber to come, and that was when I was in office as prime minister, whether we should allow Uber to come to Estonia. And one of the arguments by the traditional uh, taxi drivers uh, was that, you know, those guys don't pay taxes. Uh, as if uh, all the taxis w uh, who handle cash too, but you know, besides the point. And, and uh, what we did was uh, we offered um, uh, Uber uh, drivers an opportunity to tick a box uh, saying that uh, Uber, who actually knows exactly how, how much each driver made in this month, uh, that uh, they could, you know, if, if you as a driver opt for this, it's voluntary for you, uh, Uber will send the number, not, not where you drove or, or uh, how many times you drove, only the end number, let's say 2,000 euros, will send the data that this guy got this year or this month 2,000 euros and uh, they will take 20% as, as the tax and it's automized. So you are not uh, declaring anything, it's, it's all uh, just in a, in, a, in a blink of an eye. A uh, second option that we are now introducing, this is, will be up to 40,000 um, a year, so really a micro-business at first, but this is a testing phase or beta phase, uh, governmental startup in a way. If you owe, uh, let's say, a flower shop, and you don't uh, accept cash there, if you, if you want to do this kind of thing, it doesn't have to be a flower shop, but any, any micro-business, um, and you are, uh, you don't, you're the only guy being there, you don't need to pay for others, like uh, you don't have any, any workers or anything. You can simply say that this is the account I use and, and uh, everything can be taxed automatically. You, you, if you pay with that uh, your costs, it will go as, as the ex expenses. If you get revenue, that will be the income part. And at the end of the month, you will kind of automatically be deducted uh, the tax base. And you, you don't need to tax uh, or declare anything. Uh, and, and I think uh, why it is important is uh, for many businesses, uh, um, like, like, like the flower shops, uh, they, they, they are not into uh, that much into declaring or, or uh, reporting. They want to do their small business and, and they don't want to bother with all, all those mm. technicalities. Mm -hmm. So I think, or I hope that it will increase the entrepreneurial spirit in the society if they don't need to do all the, all the uh, uh, declarations. And of course, uh, another thing that is annoying for most businesses in our country is that you still need, and this is probably because of Eurostat requirements, you still need to uh, time to time fill in a lot of data uh, about your business uh, manually uh, to statistics. And that's something that you know, we should get rid of as well because fundamentally it's possible to know all of that without asking you and, and uh, just, just to get the big picture how much, how, how how many trades were made or, or so forth. So, doing, again, getting rid of bureaucracy is the, is the main idea. Interesting. One more question. Anybody? All right. Okay. Well, thank you, everybody. Thank Thanks, you. panelists. Thank you.
Thank you, Ron. Excellent moderating. Thank you. Thank you for coming.